This is project five of hacking with Swift. We're gonna make another game, this time with anagrams. We'll give players a random eight letter starting word, and it's their job to spell new words by rearranging those letters into smaller words. For more information, please see the website. It is hackingwithswift.com. There you'll find this tutorial, plus all 30 of the series available to buy as eBooks and high resolution videos. The books go into far more detail than these videos, they really do. Tons of explanation, tons of uh, walking you through exactly what every line of code does. So please buy the books, it helps support my work. Thank you so much. Alternatively, find me on Twitter. I am at Two Straws on Twitter and I'll do my best to help you if I have the time. Okay, let's go ahead and start up Xcode. It'll ask you what you want to create, so please choose create a new Xcode project. Then choose iOS application master detail application and click next. For a name, I'll enter project five. Uh, for devices, I recommend you choose iPhone just to keep the storyboard simple. It's gonna be a very, very uh, simple application. So going for an iPhone only app makes your life easier at this point until you have more experience. Uh, make sure use core data is turned off because core data sucks for these projects. Now click next. It'll ask you where to save it, so just choose your desktop and press create. And here's our basic application uh, ready to go. I'm gonna choose a different simulator. Uh, iPhone 5S is my preferred one for performance. Then press play, it will build it, it will run it, it will launch the iOS simulator, fire it up, and you'll see the basic template we saw in project one. Click to add dates, delete them, and so forth, just like before. Very boring. We are going to delete, delete most of this code. Not all of it, just most of it. So go ahead and stop that with command full stop or press the, uh, the command period or press the stop button here. Then go to main.storyboard and you will see in the storyboard we have this navigation controller, then the table view we just saw and then the detail view controller there. Please select the detail view controller and then press delete on your keyboard. Delete it entirely, including the segue. It all goes away. We don't want to see it again. Now on the left hand here, the uh, project navigator, uh, please just right click on detail view controller.swift and then select delete. Again, zap it, move to trash, never want to see you again, go away. So that's gone away now. So inside master view controller, we, want, we can delete some code too. Specifically, uh, get rid of everything in view did load, this thing, apart from where it calls super view did load. So this can all go like that. Then scroll down, zap the entire insert new object method. Uh, you can delete prepare for segue. Don't want any of that stuff, I can all go. Uh, and then finally, let's get rid of these two at the bottom. Can edit row at index path and commit editing, editing style. They can both go. Now the project is so small, you might think, why didn't we just start from scratch? To be fair, there is some code in here for us. You know, that storyboard with the navigation controller, the table view controller, uh, this self or index path is done for us. So we have something at least. It's not, it's better than starting from scratch. And let's face it, deleting code is quite fun. Uh, go ahead and press play and make sure it all works still. It will do nothing. You know, the buttons have gone uh, and the table is obviously blank, but it's clean. It's ready to go. It's a fantastic starting point for our actual project. So the first thing we're going to do is try and read stuff from disk, specifically an array of words. Now I've made one of these for you already. If you look in the files for this project, you'll see uh, start.txt and array plus shuffling.swift. We used this one here, the Swift file, in project two, the guess the flag game, to randomize the order of the countries. It's the same file, the same code. We want it again here. So we can get a different word each time the game is played. And this start.txt file, which if you just quick view that, you'll see a quick look at, sorry, you'll see uh, loads of stuff, or in my case, a big spinning wheel. Thank you, OS X. Uh, while that is thinking, I will open it in text edit instead, because it'd be faster, there we go. So aardvark, abacuses, abandons, abhorred, you know, abnormal. This is basically loads and loads and loads of uh, words that are eight letters long. Uh, you know, yourself. So very, very many to choose from. It means there are uh, lots of variation for our players. They get a different word each time they play. It has over 12,000 eight letter words in there. So it's very unlikely they'll face the same game twice, which is good. 
So what you want to do is uh, select both those files from the project files and drag them into your project somewhere so we can start using them. Again, make sure the screen looks like this. Copy items if needed is on. Create groups and leave targets as is and click finish. There we go. So that file is a resource file we can start using. That file's a code file we can start using. We're gonna go ahead and try and suck them into our application. Now actually, this is quite easy to do because if you look at the file, and I'll open it again in uh, text edit for sure this time, you'll see it's one per line. So one line has one word on, next line, next word, next line, next word. Always one word per line. And this line break, that thing, the line break, behind the scenes, that's saved into the file as a special character. It's saved as backslash n, like that. And we can, uh, we can use that to mean uh, line break. We can say uh, backslash n, give me a line break. And we can say get this entire file, split them up one word per line, looking for these line break characters, the backslash n things, and pull them out and work with them individually. So let's do that now. In our uh, project here, you'll see we have uh, an objects array. We'll keep that for now. That came from our template. Put it alongside that a new property. So you want to type var all words, words equals uh, bracket string and then two parentheses. So this creates an array of strings. So a bracket string and array of strings. And it creates it as well. It doesn't just define it. It declares it. It creates it with these uh, two parentheses at the end. So we have a new array which just holds uh, strings and that'll hold all our words. Now it's an array of strings, which is exactly what we want. It's gonna hold lots and lots of words in each element of the array. At the same time, we might as well change Apple's one from any object, which is the default, to be string as well. We'll be using that array to store the player's answers later on. As soon as you do that, changing any object to string, you'll get compiler errors down here. It's whinging at you saying, you know, you're saying as NS date here. It's not NS date. Fine. Zap NS date, zap dot description. Uh, and that's good. So we've fixed the compiler errors for now. We did this exact same thing in project number one. So hopefully this is an absolutely no surprise to you. So we're now going to try and load this word file into the all words array, one word per element in the array. This is done in three parts. First, we want to try and find the path to this file, the start.txt. We've done that before uh, using um, NS bundle, uh, which is, and we've seen that before, it's not a problem. Um, but this time we need something slightly different because NS bundle, last time, if you remember, we used something like uh, uh, NS bundle dot main bundle dot resource path. That tells you the path where all the files live. What we actually want is the path to one specific file. So even though we've done it before, it's slightly different this time. We'll be using a different method of main bundle to find a path to an exact file, which is fine. Uh, we'll then pull out the text of that file, load it into a string, and then split it up by line breaks. It's not very hard to do. In fact, the code looks, it's what, three lines in total perhaps? Um, so it looks like this. In, in view did load, you want to say, if let start words path equals ns bundle dot main bundle, just like before, but now this time path for resource. So it takes a parameter for the name and a parameter for of type. So our name should be quote start and of type should be txt because it is start.txt, start.txt, like that. And what will happen is this is an optional path resource might return a path if that resource exists inside the app bundle. If it doesn't, it will fail. So we, this if let unwraps the optional safely. We've done that before. It's not a big surprise, but it's the way it works here. So this thing returns an optional. We want to unwrap it safely with if let. So start a new brace there, a new curly bracket if you are so way inclined. So if we have managed to find the path for our start.txt file, then let's try and load it. Now again, the loading might fail. Perhaps we haven't got permissions to open the file. Perhaps it's completely corrupt, who knows? But to do this, we have to use a new data type you haven't seen before, and it's called ns string. 
like this, NS string. NS, uh, as you've seen uh, previously in project one, is next step. Uh, and this is the next step, the old school way of doing strings. These are objective C strings before Swift's time. Now, this is important because Swift is very new. At the time I'm making this video, it's sort of uh, seven months old maybe. And uh, it's, it's very cool, but it's not as powerful as objective C strings. NS string has many, many things it can do that the Swift string cannot yet do, and perhaps may be able to do in the future. Fortunately, Swift strings and NS strings are interchangeable. You can create one and use it like the other as often as you want to. So make a string, use it as an NS string, make an NS string, use it as a plain string, whatever you want to, it doesn't matter, they're interchangeable. Now we're going to, we're going to use a way of creating NS string that will load all that text file for us. It's beautifully easy, but it's optional again. This may or may not work, it might be corrupt. So we're gonna write, if let start words equals, then make a new NS string. And these are the options we have. Bytes, characters, and then contents of file. Plus some more, there's you know, contents of URL, and I'll get something from the web, or with a format, or with some UTF-8 stuff. We want the contents of file, and there are two of these. The first one, as you can see, uh, give me this file name, which will have this encoding, and let me know what went wrong. The second one is trickier and much more useful actually. Load this file, tell me what encoding was used, and put any errors here. Now, string encoding or text encoding is something, broadly speaking, new developers don't worry about too much. Because it's a bit of an old school thing, quite frankly, whereby uh, developers, to save you know resources and, and make things more efficient, of course, would say, I'm only using uh, the Latin one alphabet, which is what we use in English. Um, and it wouldn't recognize many kinds of characters. It can't recognize Chinese characters, for example, or, or Japanese characters. It wouldn't work. Um, nowadays, helpfully, most folks use something called UTF-8, which supports all the world's languages quite happily. So we don't really care about encoding. We don't care how the file was saved. We just know it's a text file with stuff in it. We want iOS to figure out the right string encoding for us because we just don't care. So to do that, you want used encoding, that option there, not encoding, you want used encoding. That's where it'll tell us what encoding it found rather than us telling it what encoding to use. So importantly, the coding part, contents of file, what file? Well, we want to use start words path, the thing that NS bundle told us the path to our file was. For used encoding, where should it tell us what encoding was used? Well, actually, we don't care what encoding was used. We really don't. So you can just put in nil. We just don't care. And for error, if something's gone wrong, where should I tell you what went wrong? Again, we just don't care. At this point in your Swift career, just get over it, just load the file, and open a new brace and close it again. So this bit here, this code will only execute if the file is found in the bundle and we've managed to load it successfully from disk. Then the start words will contain a string. So we don't need to look at the error here, we really don't because the if let here safely unwraps the NS string so we know it has loaded successfully. And now comes the interesting bit. We want to convert that into our array of strings. Now this is actually really easy to do because uh, strings, NS strings, have a method on them called components separated by string. I could just do start words dot components separated by string. And I type in uh, backslash n, that's the, the code meaning a line break. And that will say every time you find a new line break, split it up, split it up, keep on splitting, keep on splitting, and it'll make an array with all the things split up into, uh, by that line break. It's exactly what we want. And we can then assign that to uh, all words. We can say all words equals that. Now there's a slight hiccup here. Uh, NS string is, like I said, old school. And sadly, it returns an array of any object. So even though it started life as a string, which it did, and we're splitting on a string, so the only thing it can be realistically is a array of strings, 
Still, it returns an array of any object because it is old school um, objective C. But that's fine. We have to, just have to typecast it. So we want, want to say start words dot components separated by string as uh, string like that in an array. So that means take our array of any object and make it an array of string. And that will go ahead and load this entire file into an array of strings. That's all it takes. Those three lines of code, plus the matching braces, of course, it's all it takes to uh, successfully load in that thing so we can start working with it. We are going to add a small else statement here, though. So after the if let start words path, after the end of that brace, do else, then open another one. And this will be executed if that fails. So if we cannot find the start file in there for any reason, we've deleted it, we've decided not to include it anymore, who knows what, then we will pre-fill the all words array with an example word. So all words equals uh, bracket quote silk worm, a random eight letter word. So that's all it takes now to uh, create that array ready to use. The interesting bit comes when we start trying to use it. So let's make a new method called start game. So make some space and type func start game. This is the method that's going to set up our game ready to go. It needs to shuffle up all these words with a shuffle method imported by this uh, file here. And then it's to set the navigation bar title to be the first word in the array, which will be a random word each time. It then needs to remove all items from the objects array. So it's nice and clear. That's where we'll be storing all the player answers. And finally, it needs to reload the table, i.e. wipe out of anything that's in there right now. So it's four lines of code, uh, most of which are very straightforward. You've seen at least half of them already. So first up, shuffle the words array. So you do all words dot shuffle. Easy. That's randomize the order of the eight letter words in the starting list. And now set our title to be the first one in there. Remember arrays count from zero, they are zero based, which means you still do all words zero. To remove all the items from the objects array, you just say objects dot, you ready for this? Remove all. Uh, do you want to keep the capacity? Sure. That just means uh, don't shrink the array back down to zero size again. Keep it as big as it was. Now given our player will obviously play a new game, I think keep capacity true is probably a good idea. And the fourth line of code is to reload our table view. Remember, we have that table view from the uh, storyboard already, just like we saw in the example template. We want to reload the data because it's gonna look at this objects array and realize all the objects have gone. So line four should be just, oops, table view dot reload data, that's it. Four lines of code, shuffle the list of input words, set our title to be the first word, remove all the items in the player's answers, and then reload the table view. Straightforward. What we have to do now is call start game from inside view did load. So we can go ahead and write in here at the end of view did load, start game, that's it. Now you can go ahead and press command R or press the play button to build and run your project. And you'll see our word is pontoons. And you know, when you're recording, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of tension, all I can see is poo. Poo, look, there you go, that, that, was, that was not at all scripted. Thank you very much, iOS. Let's run it again. <laughs> oh, Hardener, fantastic, the comedy just writes itself. Okay, let's leave that, but you can see it's a random word each time. So now we want the game to prompt users to enter a word that can be made using that eight letter prompt word. For example, if the word is, you know, uh, Hardener, um, then they could enter hard or something like that, right? Um, and we're gonna use the UI alert controller that you've met before. Um, you met it in uh, project two. Um, since it's a nice fit, a pop of a message, and we're gonna add to it the ability to type text into the alert controller and read that text. So first things first, we want to add a button to our navigation bar that the user can press to say, I want to add an answer, I want to add a word to my list. So in view did load, add this code. We want to say uh, navigation item, then dot right bar button item. Again, please use code completion. It makes your life so much easier. You'll get, you'll, you will give yourself RSI if you don't use code completion because 
Uh, it, Xcode will just do so much work for you. Uh, so right bar button item equals UI bar button item. And then we want to give it a system item. Now the one we're going to choose is dot add. This is a plus symbol by default, at least in English. Uh, and then uh, self for the target. And for an action, just put quotes prompt for answer. Fantastic. We have not written that method yet, but that's okay. So when that's tapped, it'll, uh, it, we're going to make it call uh, prompt for answer, and then uh, hopefully give them a space to enter a text and, and move on from there. But this is where it gets hard. This is why Project 5 is a bit of a line in the sand for uh, Swift developers, because we're about to use closures. Now, a closure is a chunk of code that you can treat like a variable. You can kind of pass it around inside methods and functions or store it away in properties and call it later. Uh, and they're extremely powerful and they can melt your brain, quite frankly. They're hard to read sometimes. And often you, you, you find yourself thinking, yeah, I finally, I finally get closures. I really understand what they're trying to do. And then you read some vicious example online and it blasts your brain open all over again. Uh, and one of the biggest problems you'll face is called uh, a strong reference cycle. And what it means is if you have uh, our view controller here that uh, owns uh, a closure that's doing some code, but that closure in turn owns a view controller, by accident it's doing some work with the view controller, then you have a strong reference cycle. A can't delete B because B owns A and A owns B and they never get removed. Uh, and it can give you all sorts of problems, but Swift works very hard to solve these problems for you. And in fact, it makes it fairly hard to give yourself strong reference cycles as long as you're careful. So I'll explain to you as we go what's happening, but be prepared, this is hard. It's not you being slow or not you, not, you know, not working hard enough. This is genuinely difficult, don't worry about it. So after uh, start game, let's create the prompt for answer method. So I'll show you the code and then walk you through what it does. Are you set? Whew. Let's do it. So func prompt for answer, parentheses, open brace. So first up, we're gonna create an alert controller, just like in project two. So let AC equals UI alert controller with the title, enter answer message. We don't want a message really. And preferred style dot alert flash up something on the screen we then want to add a text view that's a text field sorry to this alert so we say ac dot add text field with configuration handler now this mess of parentheses and arrows and dashes and exclamation marks it is hideous that is closure syntax and what we're going to do is we're going to write nil because quite frankly, I have not got the patience to walk through all that hideous closure stuff. It really is unnecessarily hard in places. But that's okay. We'll do one yet. We're going to add an action to this. We're using UI alert action. Now before we just had a word saying continue and it called ask question if you remember. Uh, this time we're not going to take a shortcut. We're going to do the real thing. So let's do uh, let submit action equals UI alert action. Then you see at the end all the parentheses and arrows and brackets and exclamation marks and horrors. That means the closure is coming up. Sorry. Uh, title submit. Style can be dot default. And handler. This is where it gets tricky. So we're going to sneak in something special here. Again, just to save yourselves a little bit of pain. I'm gonna press delete on that code and delete the bracket and delete handler back to default. I've zapped all that closure syntax. Instead, I end the parenthesis, open a brace and write some different code on the same line. This is a stylistically way of doing it. You wanna write bracket unowned self comma, AC, bracket, then parenthesis, action, colon, UI, alert action, 
exclamation mark in and then end the parenthesis and end the brace sorry like that that quite frankly i think is uh, hideous syntax but that's what we have to work with uh, please don't worry if you're looking at that and it's frying your brain slightly that's exactly how it should look um, i'll explain to you in a second what it does let's finish this first after the in a new line you want to write let answer equals ac dot text fields exclamation mark bracket zero as ui text field then self dot submit answer answer dot text and then after this brace write ac dot add action submit action and finally, present view controller AC, animated true, completion nil. That is all the code. And that introduces so much stuff in just a handful of lines of code. It's really remarkable how difficult closures are for beginners. There are no other ways around this. I'd love to short circuit this again. I cannot at this point. It's time to use the uh, actual closures inside Swift. So let's have a look at what this code does starting by eliminating the easy stuff. So here we have creating a new UI alert controller. We've done that before in project two, it's not new, it's old, easy peasy, forget about it, move on. This bit adds a text field to the alert controller. That's all it does. A single line editable text field that users can type into. We could do much more with it, but it's more than enough for now. Don't worry about it, it's fine. Leave this chunk, look at this, AC add action. Add the, the submit button to the alert view. And then finally, show it on the screen. Also from project two. Both these lines are from project two, as is that one. So that's not new, it's old stuff, really very easy. That leaves the hard stuff, this chunk in the middle. And there are actually, remarkably, in this small chunk of code, three actual lines and a little brace at the end, there are five new things to learn in just those three lines of code, all of which are really important. So let's start with the easiest first. UI text field. You have already seen UI label, it was in project one. That's a simple type of view that shows uneditable text on the screen. A UI text field is editable text on the screen. Exactly the same as a label, just now that the user can edit it. And we're adding a single one here in our code and pulling it back out again here. Next up. We are using here something called trailing closure syntax. Trailing closure syntax. I know you might be complaining, wow, I haven't even finished learning about regular closures and they're already trying to get me doing trailing closures. Well, they are related. And the trailing closures do make the syntax slightly easier. So give it a chance. I want to show you a little bit of the code we had in project two. We had this code in project two. We had uh, UI alert action uh, title was continue in project two then it was style default and handler was ask question ask question like that so this is from a very similar situation we're using a ui alert controller to show information on the screen we're using ui alert action to add buttons to it and then in that project we used ask question we made it call a separate method simply because it was too much at the time to try and explain closures. It would put you off Swift entirely. But if you remember at the time, I passed ask question to the UI alert action to mean when continue is tapped, please call ask question. This time I'm saying when submit is tapped, use this code. It's like an inline anonymous function call, method call. It's just like having uh, all of ask question pasted into here. Anonymously, it hasn't got a name anymore. It's not called ask question, it's just some code you've pasted in. Now, what we could have done using UI alert action is written handler, lots of code here, lots of code here, then end that brace, oops, crazy, then end that brace and then end the, the thing. We could have done that, but it's really ugly. So Swift has a built-in way called trailing closure syntax. 
that makes the code much nicer and easier to read. And the rule is this, if the last thing in any method call is a closure, like this, a chunk of anonymous code you want to run when something happens, you can delete it and instead just open a brace like that and call it all in there, like this, here. Your code goes here. So that rewrites the same thing just using trailing closure syntax. And that's what we're doing here. So I deleted the word handler and all that mess after it and made a trailing closure. This stuff will be called whenever the button is tapped. So that's what trailing closure syntax is. We're using it here. Next up, this bit. If you remember from project two, we had to have a function, a method uh, called ask question that looked like this. We had ask question and it was that. And as soon as I tried to use that inside a UI alert action, we had errors in project two. It made us modify this to accept action UI alert action. What was the UI alert action that triggered this method? And it was very helpful at the time to let us evaluate the tag and the titles of stuff to see what was going on. Very helpful. That bit is exactly that bit. They are identical because these are the parameters our anonymous method, as it were, our closure is accepting, passing in these things. So literally, it takes these bit, that bit there and moves it into there. That's all it's doing. So it's saying, I want to accept the button that was tapped as a parameter and start working with it there. You have to do that. It hasn't got a choice. Now, what you can do, because Swift knows you'll be given a UI alert action, you don't have to write it out quite so clearly. I'm going to delete this ask question method again just to avoid confusion. You don't have to write it all out. Swift knows it's going to be a UI alert action. So you can actually write action in. And it'll do the same thing. You'll get a variable called action, uh, which happens to be a UI alert action. And you can start using it. Uh, it's just a shorter way of doing it because we know Swift will do the work for us. Now, actually, in our current project, we don't need this UI alert action because we know it, the submit button was tapped. There's only one button attached to this code. We know which button was tapped. We don't care what, uh, to have the UI alert action. Um, so what Swift lets you do is say, I don't even care what that thing is called. So you can just write underscore in like that, underscore in, which means I accept a parameter. I have to accept a parameter. Swift knows what it is, but I don't care. Next up, fourth and fifth thing to learn. We're gonna put these two together. The first one is unowned self AC and then self here. So when you execute a closure like this, you've got this chunk of code here. Swift captures everything used in your code, which as you can see is the alert controller and the view controller self because we'll call submit answer, which we haven't written yet. That's why it's warning us, but we cap it needs to capture the alert controller and the view controller because, you know, on the interface, they'll see an alert pop up. The user will think, hmm, what does that say? Enter answer. Let me type in my answer. Take some time, do some corrections. Finally, press submit. You know, quite a few seconds will pass by. Swift has to make sure that it has references to uh, the alert controller and the view controller when it comes time to call this code. So when the user finally presses submit, it has already got a copy of the alert controller and a copy of the view controller ready to call these methods on and start doing stuff with. That is capturing. And this is where strong reference cycles come in. So uh, the block, the, so the closure, sorry, this closure here owns, has to take a copy of the view controller and the alert controller. Now, what if, uh, you know, the, the view controller has the alert controller owned because it's showing it, uh, and the uh, alert controller also has this alert action owned because it's inside it. But at the same time, the, the closure's owning the view controller and the closure's owning the alert controller. The ownership goes both way. A owns B and B owns A. You've got a strong reference cycle, which means the stuff will never go away. It's dangerous, so Swift will not let you do that by default. You have to tell it, I really know what I'm doing. And that is this bit and this bit. First up, 
we have square brackets, unowned self, comma, AC, then bracket. And that just means, Swift, when you capture self, the view controller, and when you capture AC, the alert controller, you must not hold onto them strongly. You do not own these things. They are unowned by you. Which means a code in here will have a very weak reference to them. It doesn't matter if they go away is what it means. So the strong reference cycle is broken. But even then, Swift ensures you must have the word self when referencing the view controller before it. You can't just write submit answer because it's dangerous. You, it wants you to be absolutely sure you know exactly what you're doing. You must write self dot, now, self dot here. Now I told you before that a lot of people like writing self everywhere and lots of places they'd write, you know, self dot all words dot shuffle, self dot title, self dot objects, self dot table view. People write code like this still. Um, and that's fine, it's their choice. But the problem is, this situation inside a closure, self is required. You must do it in order to show Swift you've thought things through, you know what you're doing. Let me delete this code here again, that's where we were. And because it's important here, it's really meaningful here, having it elsewhere kind of waters it down a little bit. So a lot of people, including me, prefer to use self dot only when you really have to, like here. It's a very important example. So that's how you write a closure. When this button is clicked, submit. Pass in self and the alert controller, unowned, don't hold a strong reference to them, as well as the action that was tapped, but we don't care what it was called. In, that means the method is from here on in. So this bit is the method here. Call this code, then that code, and then spin on. That's all it takes. Now, that's closures. That's an example closure. I know there's a lot to learn. We'll be using them again and again and again. So if you're thinking here, that made absolutely no sense. Don't worry about it. That's fine. They are hard. If you find them hard, that's perfectly normal. Let's go back to doing some easier coding. So there are warnings here because submit answer does not exist. Let's make it exist by saying uh, func submit answer and it will accept some text the thing you use a type, so answer colon string. And that should make your code compile successfully because now at least it's happy. So we've gone over all those five things being used in there, you know, trailing closure syntax, unowned self, a parameter being passed in, the need for self dot, all that kind of stuff. It's really important, but we haven't yet talked about these two lines of code. What is our closure actually doing when it executes? Fortunately, there isn't really a whole lot there. Um, as you can see, there's just two lines of code. The first one creates a new constant called answer, which it sets to be the text field at index zero of the alert controller. Now we have to use the uh, force unwrap operator here, the exclamation mark, because uh, text fields might not exist. It's maybe, maybe not. Now we happen to know it does exist because we added it just here. So it's not a problem. So we force unwrap it and say, give me the first text field that I created just seconds ago. And then call submit answer with the text that the user entered into that text field. Dead easy. Now comes the easy stuff. What should submit answer do? Well, a number of things. It needs to check, uh, is this word possible? You know, literally, can you spell this anagram word from the starting word? It needs to check, is the word original? Has it been used before? And finally, it needs to check, is the word real? Is this even a real word? Are they making up as a word and hoping to get points? It's a game, we can't allow that. So we're gonna go ahead and fill in the uh, submit answer method uh, with some code. And again, I'll type it in and we'll walk through what it does afterwards. So submit answer, first up, let's do let lower answer equals answer dot lower case string then if word is possible lower answer open brace inside that if word is original lower answer open brace inside that if word is real lower answer open brace 
So at this point, any code here will only execute if the word is possible and is original and is real. What we'll do is we'll call objects.insert uh, the answer at index zero, then add it to our table using uh, let index path equal ns index path for row zero in section zero, and finally table view dot insert rows at index path bracket index path bracket with your animation dot automatic. That is the entire method. Now temporarily ignore the word is possible, word is original, word is real methods for now. Let's focus on the rest of the code first. So if a uh, user has uh, the word, oh yeah, we had, uh, was it hardener or something like that? That's our word, that's what we had before, hardener. Let's get a different word, well, I can't, never mind, hardener. Hardener will do for now. Then they go, aha, well I, I can see inside there, I can see the word uh, rend. And they go r -e -n -d, as their word. That does not exist in the word hardener. It doesn't exist. Because strings are case sensitive, which means rend and rend and rend and r -e -n -d, are all different because the capital letters mean different things to the lowercase strings. We want to avoid this problem. We don't really care what the user types as long as the letters exist. So the very first thing we do in this submit answer method is get their answer and make a lowercase version of it. So we have a lowercase and we can search through the word for without worrying about case entirely. Very straightforward. We then have these three if statements all nested, all one inside the other. And only if all three are true are these three lines called. So once we know the word is good, the first thing we do is insert it into our objects array at position zero, which means put it in the very front of the array. Now we're doing it that way, which means uh, in, when you're running the game back, it will appear at the top of the table rather than at the bottom. Because of course, while they're playing, they won't be able to see the bottom of the uh, table very much whereas they will be able to see the top. So it's nice and clear to use as their word's been added successfully. The next two things are related. Uh, so you saw in that index path before briefly in uh, project one, uh, and we have to create one to insert this item into the table view. Now you, you should think, wait a minute, how, why do we need to insert rows into the table? The table reads from the objects array in this template, which it does. Um, surely we can just use that instead. Not quite, um, because the object array has changed, but the table view doesn't know it's changed. Now we could say something like this, table view reload data. Reload yourself entirely and pull out all the new objects and all the old objects and relay yourself out. We could do that and it would work perfectly fine. But it'd be slower because it's doing more work and also less pleasing for users. We can, we can, rather than make things just flash in in a split second, we can animate them in automatically, which is a much nicer way of doing it. And actually, that's what this method here does. Insert row and index path with animation automatic will choose the system default method for adding rows to a table view. So it's super simple. There are two small quirks here. First is this index path thing. We used it before um, and we're using it again. The thing to know is we are not, again, using sections. We have no sections in our table view, which means sections should always be zero at this point. Sections, as a reminder, are those uh, horizontal bars you see in things like the contacts application. It's very good, not needed here. Uh, second, there are other animations to look at. Uh, it's down to you, can, you can go ahead and look at the various uh, animations for table views, but realistically, dot automatic means just do whatever is the right thing for this animation, so generally you want dot .automatic. I'll remove this random hardener in our code, and of course our code will not compile. I can press build and it will just whinge. No chance, error, 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 error all over the place. Six errors it says, bad. And that happens bluntly because word is possible, word is original, and word is real. None of these things exist. We haven't made these methods yet. So we're going to make some stubs. 
which is like a dummy holding method we'll come back to later, later just to show the code is kind of working. So uh, we'll say uh, func word is possible. It must take a word, which is a string, open brace. And in here, uh, I want you to write something new. Return true. That means send back true from this method, which means if word is possible with that answer, it will return true or false and evaluate more code or not. Now Swift will warn you because this method has been told to return true, but this thing called the method signature does not specify a return value. It doesn't say it's returning anything. It doesn't expect to return anything. And Swift automatically evaluates all possible forms of the, of the method, all possible code paths, to make sure nothing is being returned. And yet here we are returning true straight away. So what we do is we tell Swift, actually, this method is going to return true or false. And that the data type is called a bool, short for Boolean, bool. So it's a dash, then a write Pulp Fiction bracket, then bool. And that means I will return true or false from this method. And that code compiles correctly again. So please now copy and paste that twice more like that and rename the second one to be word is original and the third one to be word is real this time the code compiles cleanly because all these methods now exist so you should be able to go ahead and press command r now to run your program back you'll see the blank table full our word is scoopful obviously uh, and i can press this plus button to see our answer screen, and I can write, I, I don't know what it is with, with me and seeing the word poo, but there it is right in front of me. Um, I'll write uh, cops, C-O-P-S, submit, brilliant. There's my thing, you see it animating nicely, it just fades in, the keyboard goes away. That's exactly the kind of smooth user experience we want. So, non of our methods so far in this series have returned a value. This stuff, this bool, this is the first time we are returning a value from our method. So these booleans can either be uh, true or false, and it makes them perfect for these uh, if statements. So if true or false, if true or false, if true or false. And of course, if it has to be true, 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 then finally uh, this stuff executes. Now. The body of these methods just has one thing in there right now, saying return true every time to say, yeah, the word's fine, yeah, it's original, yeah, it's real, every time. We want to have more code in there to have, you know, actual real methods doing real functionality. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look to see uh, whether the word has been used before or not. Now we know this because the user, when they get a word correct, has the answer entered into this array called objects. That's the one that Xcode's template made for us originally. And we can use that object array to say, hey, do you contain the answer already? Uh, and if the answer is, is, is yes, then we don't let them add the answer again. It's that simple. Now Swift has a built-in uh, function to do this for us called contains. And what you do is you say uh, in word is original, contains objects word. So the first parameter is the thing to search. In our case, it's this array, this objects array here. And the second thing is the thing to search for. We want to search for the word being passed in. So this line means, does the objects array contain the word the user's trying to add? And that will return true or false. Does it contain it? Yes, or does it not contain it? No. And we return that value back to the caller. But think carefully. If object does contain the word, it'll return true. So this line basically means return true if the word has been used already, which is the opposite of what we want. Word is original should return true if it does not contain the word. To mean not you use a very familiar symbol, but it means something entirely different here. It is an exclamation mark. Now you've already seen these things when working with uh, implicitly unwrapped optionals and force unwrapping of optionals. So you'd say something like, you know, uh, 
va fu is a string whatever at the end of the data type that means uh, it is an implicitly unwrapped optional when it's before this it means reverse the a boolean it, it means not or opposite so if contains returns true yes the objects array contains the word the exclamation mark will say actually flip it around and return false no for word is original don't say it's allowed which is great and that's the first method done that's word is original done we say return not contains objects word that's all it takes the next one up word is possible i'm sorting these by difficulty by the way just to help you get through them more easily is a word possible can a word be spelt from uh, a scoopful now for a word to be possible <clears throat> we insist that each letter must be used only once so if they try and use a word twice uh, a letter twice sorry we just have to not allow it otherwise it'd be too easy they could make all sorts of of words out of things um, so the word is possible will try and ensure that when the user, user enters an answer every letter that is used only exactly once so we know it's one s no more than one c no more than two o's one p one f one u and one l so that's what this is going to do and i've got a very very simple algorithm for this i've, I've tried to make it as simple as possible uh, to find out how a word is possible or not uh, and the algorithm is quite simple so what happens is we're going to uh, loop through every letter in the player's answer seeing whether it exists in the eight letter start word we're playing with now if it does exist we remove the letter from the start word then continue the loop so if we try to use a letter twice it will exist the first time it will find it the first time but it will then get removed so it does not exist a second time and the check will fail it's the simplest way of using uh, the, this, this algorithm as uh, so hopefully you'll better see it uh, quite clearly so the first thing we're going to do in here is make a temp copy of the answer of the uh, start word so we'll say uh, in in word is possible place that with var temp word equals title exclamation mark dot lowercase string so we we have to lowercase obviously because we're lowercasing the uh, players thing coming in so we have to make sure it's definitely a lowercase string it ought to be but just to make sure it needs to have an exclamation mark there because the, the the view controller may have a title or it may not we're saying it does because we've given it one already and put it in here as a copy and we have to make a copy it's really important to make a copy because we'll be deleting letters from this over time to evaluate whether the word is possible or not we don't want to modify the title of course we want to modify a temporary thing so now let's loop through every letter in the user's word. So we'll say for letter in word, open brace, word being the parameter being passed in to the method. And now we're going to use the range of string method. We use this in project four uh, to evaluate whether a new website was in our list of safe websites. We'll use it slightly differently here and you'll see why in a second. Uh, so I'll say if let pause equals temp word dot range of string remember most of these parameters are completely optional don't worry about them and then this is new string parenthesis letter bracket bracket like that then open brace so what's happening here is we're saying um, loop through every letter in word but this is important word is a string as you can see the letters the individual letters are not strings there's a special data type in Swift you type L E T T there you go it's telling us letter is actually a character which is basically a single letter string but it's not a real string we can't just do range of string letter because that's not a string See, it's complaining now character is not made into string you're right we have to create a new string inside there like that just like the way we're making floats out of doubles in project 4 uh, we're converting that character into a string so we can pass it into range of string now range of string is optional it might return the range or it might find nothing at all we don't know so we unwrap it carefully 
if let pause equals range of string means if we find something in there, then we'll do one more check. If the thing that it found is actually completely empty, it didn't really find anything, it's a, a false positive, then we want to return false from our method. This letter was not found in the answer, in the start word. Otherwise, we're going to remove the letter from the temp word array. Uh, and this is super simple to do. You just say uh, temp word dot remove at index uh, our position dot start index like that. So it will remove that letter. So if, if our word was um, cops, it would say uh, four letter in word. Okay, I've got C. Uh, does C exist in temporary word? If not, return false. This word is not possible. If it does exist, remove the C from the start word and carry on going around and around and around. Uh, if this does return nil, oops, this one here does return nil. If we can't get a range of string for some reason from the string, then we also want to return false. We failed somehow, just, just get out while we can. And if we are still here at the end, if we've been through all letters in our word and found them all inside our uh, temporary word, our, our matching eight letter start word, we want to return true. And that will make all the errors go away because Swift will make sure every possible method, every possible code path will return something. Otherwise, it cannot be said to return bool. So Swift makes sure very carefully we return a boolean no matter what. So that's the method. It's not too difficult. We loop through every letter in the user's word, see where it exists in our start word. If it does not exist, return false either here or here. Otherwise, we remove it from the start word and carry on the loop. And if we get to the end of the word and we found all the letters, we return true. Yes, the word is possible. That just leaves word is real. Now we're gonna take a little cheat here because I, there's only so many new things you can learn at once and you've already seen closures. So quite frankly, if you learn nothing else this project, you've done a very good job. So we're gonna cheat. Word is real is not gonna take word string as its parameter. It's going to take an NS string. And remember, this is the next step version of string. It's totally interchangeable with Swiss strings, but it has a few interesting quirks that make your life easier. Specifically, iOS has a built-in text checking system that uses NS strings in a very easy way. So replace the word, uh, the return true call in word is real with this. Let checker, like a new variable called checker, equals UI text checker. And that's the class that does most of the work inside this code to handle checking for stuff. We now have to tell it what range we want to check, and the answer is we want to check the entire word. So we'll say let range equals ns make range. It wants a location, where to start, zero. And it wants a length, how much of the text to search. We want to use the word's length. Use the entire length of the word, please. And now we're going to say, please tell me where the misspelled words are. Bit of a long one. This is let misspelled range equals checker dot range of misspelled words in string with tons of parameters. Just press enter to complete that whole method. First parameter, what is a string to check? Well, the string is word. The thing the user's passed in. The second parameter, what range should we check inside this word? The answer is, well, for us, we made a variable called range. The entire string, please. Starting at and wrap work together. We won't be using them much here, in fact, at all. We'll just put, uh, ignoring them. And uh, it allows you to check starting partway through a string. And then if it finishes it, it can wrap back to the beginning again and check up to where it started. Um, which is quite a common spell checking behavior in something like uh, Microsoft Word. But here we've got like just one word in there, cops or something. Um, so we actually, we don't care. We don't want to start at the first place, zero, and wrap false. We just don't wrap. You don't need to wrap. And finally, language is a string. You specify en, it will do English. 
I guess FR for French, DE for German, ES for Spanish, and so on. So that means find where the misspelled words are in this string. And this returns an NS range, which is actually what this thing is here, which again has a start position and a length. So a location and a length. And what will happen is, if we get back a special value called NS not found for the location, it means UI text checker was unable to find a spelling error in the word, and therefore the word is real. So what we can do is we can return misspelled range dot location equals equals is equal to NS not found, like that. That's a short way of writing uh, a longer bit of code, you don't tend to see it so much, but you can actually write instead, you know, if misspelled range dot location is equal to ns not found, then return true, uh, else return false. So th those sort of five lines, these ones, evaluate the same thing as that. So if misspelled range location is equal to not found, this becomes true and therefore it means return true, the word is real. So that's preferred way of writing that kind of check. And that completes the third of our missing methods, which means the project is now almost complete. You can go ahead and press run now, and don't give me a dirty word or something like that. Greatest, oh, what a brilliant word that is. So I'm gonna say, uh, I, I can spell in here the word taste, submit. There it is, taste. Uh, and I can also spell the word tastier, Ah, nothing happened. Perfect. It realized there it cannot spell tastier using this. There is no I. Um, I can spell the word great. Uh, and I'm going to write grain. Submit. Doesn't like it. Um, similarly, so that's that's word is possible failing correctly. If I now try and repeating something using word as original, I'll do great again. Nope, won't take it. And finally, word is real. I'm gonna make a word up. Greet. Yeah, that's a nice word, greet. Nope, won't take it. UI text checker found it as misspelled and returned correctly. So the game actually works now. We've got something coming together quite nicely. But there's a problem, a very boring problem, and one we're gonna fix, but it is quite tedious. And um, sadly, there is some tedious parts of coding, believe it or not. I was typing words in there like greet, which is obviously a brilliant word, and tastiest or tastier, whatever I chose, or great, repeating myself, and the game was failing, which is the right thing to do. Sorry, I'm not gonna add that word, but it didn't say why it was failing. So as a user, I'm like, what, greet's a brilliant word. Why don't you like the word greet? Um, so that the thing to do is look for our submit answer method here, and you'll see if, 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 we're gonna add else blocks to each of these ifs. Else something, then else something, then else something else. So if the word is real, add it into the array and do something cool with it. Otherwise, we want to say, you know, you, you can't make up words, sorry. So we'll say, uh, let AC equals UI alert controller. Don't worry, no closures coming up. Title, word not recognized. Uh, message, you can't just make them up, you know. Then preferred style is alert. And then we'll add an action to it, uh, UI alert action with the title OK, style default. And handler, that's a closure normally, but if you just use nil, it means just dismiss the alert controller and spin on. And finally, present view controller AC, right, true. Completion nil, do nothing. Copy and paste that into this else block and then into this else block. And obviously give them different messages. So for this one, this is if word is original has failed, we'll modify this to be word used already. Message can be be more original. And finally for this last one, this matches up with word is possible. Uh, so if the word is simply cannot be spelled using the letters they have, we'll have the title word not possible. And the message can be, you can't spell that word from. And we're going to use here 
uh, string interpolation, which you saw in project two to do the score. Um, so we'll do a, a single quote just to make it look nicer on the screen. Then backslash parenthesis to do our string interpolation. We want to put a actual variable value into there. Uh, and we're going to use title exclamation mark dot lowercase string end parenthesis end single quote and then exclamation mark. The only actual bit in there is is that's the actual code. The rest of it is just quotes. So you can say you know from meh like that and exclamation mark. So that's not code. That's just part of the string. Uh, so the the interpolation means get the lowercase string version of our title again. Force unwrapping it because we know it's safe and interpolate it into this larger string to make the thing work correctly. That's it. That's the tedious code written, the bit copy and pasting it's done. Please go ahead and run the code. Give me a decent word to begin with. Imitates. Fine. So if it imitates, uh, you can go ahead and have a go at spelling a word, uh, and it will tell you correctly if I do uh, greet again. Submit. It should say, that's not possible. You cannot spell that word from this thing, which is fantastic. If I use uh, sate, that's fine. If I use same, that's fine. If I use sate again, it will say, N -n -n, no, sorry, you need to be more original. So it's now working correctly and doing our checks as you'd expect, which is fantastic. So that ends the game. I hope that was actually a bit of fun for you to make. You've learned an awful lot again. Uh, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, but that is the purpose of this course, bluntly. Uh, you've seen more of UI table view. That's this thing here, scrolling around, which you used in table one. You've used it again and learned some more about it. You've learned some more about UI alert controller, including how to add text fields. But you've seen some real hardcore Swift stuff too, not least closures and method return values and booleans and ranges. And of course, NS string, which you'll use again in the future, is a brilliant thing to use to be able to know that this technology is there for you to rely on. Uh, the code is now yours to go and play with. Please make some great stuff. For more information, please see the website hackingwithswift.com where you can buy this tutorial as a high resolution video. Don't watch this blurry copy on YouTube. Watch it on the high res video and help support my work. Alternatively, buy the book. The book's got so much more information and lots more explanation. Please go and buy a copy. It does help support my work. And finally, uh, find me on Twitter. I am at Two Straws. Have fun.